Welcome to Global Marketing Management and now we will talk about export and import management and I have dedicated three modules that is module 32, 33 and 34 to this export import management and I will let you know why three modules have been dedicated to export and import management. So in this module we will talk about organizing for exporting, indirect exporting, direct exporting, mechanics of exporting. Now you see that this is the first and the easiest and the least risky mode of uh, entering a, a global business arena. Most companies, almost all the companies they have or they are still using this mode uh, for operating globally. So even a global company may be exporting in some countries and obviously small companies the first step that they take uh, for global operations uh, is exporting. So that is why uh, we, will, we, we will have to understand exporting in, in more detail. So this is one of the most popular way for many companies to become international. Exporting is obviously the first way of foreign entry used by many companies. Selling to foreign markets involve numerous high risk arising from lack of knowledge about and unfamiliarity with, the, with that environment. So, the, so, so a domestic company does not know about a foreign company, what, uh, what may be the laws and what, uh, what may be the problems there, what will the customers be. So that, that uh, increases the risk, therefore this exporting provides the least risky way uh, by which the company can, uh, can, can take the first step towards uh, global marketing. Another problem is conducting marketing research across national borders is even more difficult and complex and subjective then it is at domestic uh, uh, domestic counterparts and uh, we have talked about the marketing research process in in the in one of the earlier module and with every export transaction there is a equivalent or opposing import transaction aside from differences between the procedure and rationale for exports and import both are largely the same the world over for and for successful development of export activities Systematic collection of information is crucial, is critical because now this is the first step and whether the company will globalize further or not. So this first step will determine if it is the, if they have taken the right step and the, and the fruits are uh, and they are able to get benefits out of this first step then obviously uh, the second step will follow very quickly. But if it is not so then the company may uh, will retreat and then again it may take a longer period of time to restart export activities and to move on to the next uh, step. How to go about organizing for exports? So first is uh, conducting research for exports. The first use your available secondary data to research potential markets. So lots of secondary data is available that should be used in the first place. The identification of an appropriate market involves the the, uh, the following criteria, the first is the socio-economic characteristics, the political and legal characteristics, then there are some certain consumer uh, variables that is lifestyle, culture, taste and purchasing behavior and the financial conditions. So here we are talking of the external environment and here we have talked about the customers. So first we look at the, uh, the, uh, the broader variables and then we move on to the narrower va variables of, uh, related to consumers. In indirect exporting, how to go about doing in indirect ex exporting and then we will move on to the direct ex exporting. So we are moving from the least risky and going, uh, going upwards towards more riskier options. So this indirect exporting is the least risky. It involves the use of an independent intermediary or agent to market the firm's product overseas. These agents they assume the responsibility of the marketing the firm's product through their network of foreign distributors and their own sales force. So now they, uh, the company is selling to a, a independent, independent intermediary and then this independent intermediary he, they, he will do exporting, uh, uh, he will do the rest of the thing and, and he because and he may have network uh, of foreign distributors or it may have its own sales force. So this may include a combination export manager, export merchants, export brokers, export commission houses, 
trading companies and piggyback exporting. Now, let us look at the major types of trading companies and their country of origin. The first type is the general trading companies and their historical involvement and they have come up because of their historical involve, involvement in generalized imports and exports. So, uh, these are the examples of these companies. For example, you have Asia, Asiat, uh, East Asiatic in Denmark and Sito in Japan. So, now these companies they, they were traditionally historically they were into uh, exporting and importing and uh, this is what the first type that is general trading company. The second type is export trading company. So, the rational for their existence is they have a specific mission to promote growth of exporters. Hyundai in Korea, Interbras in Brazil, CS World Trade in the US are examples of this kind of export trading companies. Then there are federated export marketing groups. So, these are loose collaboration among exporting companies supervised by a third party and they are usually market specific. For example, you have FedDIC, uh, UK, SBI group in, in Norway. Another type of, uh, of this trading company is the trading arm of a multinational company. So, the rationale for, uh, for the grouping is that they have specific international trading operations in a parent company's operation. So, the parent company is there and they are this trading, they are the trading arms of this parent company. For example, General Motors of US and IBM of US, they have this kind of trading arms. Then there are bank based or affiliated trading groups. So, the bank is at the center of, of a group and, and it extends commercial activities. For example, Mitsubishi of Japan. Then there are certain commodity trading companies. So, the long standing export trading in a specific market. So, these are the two examples for that. From indirect exporting, the next step is to move on to direct exporting. So, uh, this direct exporting takes place when a manufacturer or exporters sell directly to uh, an importer or buyer located in a foreign market. Now, in uh, just keep in mind that, that in indirect exporting, this company was selling to an independent uh, uh, organization and that independent organization was, was uh, doing the rest of the thing. In direct exporting, the manufacturer or the exporter, he sell directly to an importer or a buyer that, who is located in the foreign market. Now, now, now the things become becomes more riskier. So, as export activities grow in scale and of complexity, more most firms they create a separate export department or export sales subsidiary or a foreign sales branch. Now, let us look at the comparison of direct and indirect exporting. So, in indirect exporting, there is a low setup cost, while in direct cost or direct exporting, the setup cost is high. In indirect exporting, exporters tend not to gain good knowledge of export market because they are selling to a domestic uh, company. But in direct exporting, it leads to better knowledge of export markets and international expertise due to this direct contact. The credit, the credit risk lies mostly with the middlemen in indirect exporting. So, there, there are no credit risk with the original company in indirect exporting. While in direct exporting, credit risks are higher, especially in early years. In indirect exporting, since it is not in the interest of the middlemen doing the exporting, customer loyalty really develops. So, he is not worried about, about the customer loyalty. But in direct exporting, customer loyalty can be developed for the exporter's brand more easily because now the manufacturer himself comes into picture. Let us look at the export import policy of 2015 and 2020. So, the foreign trade in India is guided by the export and import policy of, uh, of the government of India. This policy is a five year plan and it is updated every year on 31st of March and the modifications, improvements and new schemes become effective from 1st April of every year. The exim policy of the Indian government is regulated by the Foreign Trade Development Regulation Act 1992. What are the key highlights of this exim policy? So, in the Foreign Trade Policy 2015 to 2020, it provides the framework for increasing exports of goods and services as well as generation of employment and increasing value addition 
in the country in line with Make in India program. So, now you see that it has focus on two things increasing exports of goods and services one sec, uh, and the second is generation of employment and the third is increasing value addition. So, these three uh, uh, things are to be done and this is in line with the Make in India program. So, the first is to increase exports or uh, exports of goods and services and generation of employment and increasing value addition within the country. The policy aims to enable India to respond to the challenges of the external environment keeping in step with the rapidly evolving international trading architecture and make trade a major contributor to the country's economic growth and development. So, therefore, when these uh, these three objectives are achieved achieved so that will lead to, comp uh, to comp the country's economic growth and development. Now, this uh, FTP 2015 to 20 has introduced two new schemes namely mercantilized exports from India a scheme for exports of a specific goods to a specified markets one. The second scheme is service exports from India scheme. So, in the first scheme we are uh, we are exporting the goods and second we are exporting the services and that is for increasing profits of notified services. 108 MSME that is micro small medium enterprises clusters have been identified identified for focused intervention to boost exports. So, in uh, in 108 uh, clusters the government will have will give a special uh, focus so that uh, uh, they can boost exports accordingly Niryat Bandhu scheme has been galvanized and repositioned to achieve the objectives of skill India. So, in the first India in the first case we were talking about make in India now we are talking of skill India and there are number of steps have been taken for encouraging manufacturing and exports under 100 percent export oriented units and software technology parks of India and, and various scheme and these steps include a fast track clearance facility for these units permitting them to share infrastructure facilities permitting intra unit transfer of goods and services permitting them to set up warehouses near the port of export and to use duty free equipment for training purposes. Measures have also been taken to give a boost to export of defense and high tech items. Trade facilitation and enhancing the ease of doing business are the other major focus areas in this foreign trade policy. One of the major objective of this new foreign trade policy is to move towards paperless working in a 24 by 7 environment. Let us start with mechanics uh, looking at the mechanics of exporting how to go about starting exports. So, exports in itself is a wide concept and lots of preparation is required by an exporter before they can start the export business. Now, how to go about starting an export business? So, so the uh, we, we will look at the various steps that are needed to start an export business. So, the first is to establish an organization. To start with the export business the first as a sole property concern or partnership concern or a company has to be set up as per the procedure with an attractive name and logo. So, the first step is to establish a company and the idea is that it should have an attractive name and logo which is attractive the name should be attractive to the customers across the world or in different countries and logo is also attractive to the people across the world. After having that done that the next step is opening of a bank account and for that a current account with a bank with a bank that is authorized to deal in foreign exchange should be opened. After that there is a need to obtain a permanent account number. It is necessary for every exporter and importer to obtain a PAN from the income tax department. The fourth step is to obtain an importer's exporter's code number that is IEC. So, this IEC is a 10 digit number which is mandatory for undertaking exports and import. Without this number uh, exports and imports cannot be taken. So, if a company st uh, stops at third step it will not be st it will not still be able to make export and import. Application for obtaining IEC number can be submitted to the regional authority of the directorate general of foreign trade in form A and F 2 A along with the documents that are listed there. Applicants can also apply for E IEC that is electronic importer exporter code on the DGFT website. The address of this website is given here 
only one IEC can be obtained against a single pan. The next step is to have a registration come membership certificate for a availing authorization to import and export or any other benefit or concession under the foreign trade policy 2015 to 2020 as also to avail the services or guidance exporters are required to obtain a registration come membership certificate granted by the concerned export promotion councils or the commodity board or there may be other authorities who will do that. The next step is, so this, this, this is uh, the procedural part, now comes more important part for the purpose of, of business is the selection of product. All items are freely exportable except few items which appears in the prohibited or restricted list. After studying the trends of export of different products from India, proper selection of the products to be exported may be made. So, first you have to identify what are the different products that are, are exported from India and then you will have to do, uh, uh, do the proper selection of which products you would like to export. The next step is the selection of markets. So, after having selected the product, then comes selection of markets. An overseas market should be selected after research covering the market size, competition, quality requirement and payment terms. Exporters can evaluate the market based on the export benefits available for a few countries. So, there are some export benefit available under the foreign trade policy. So, exporters can also uh, look at those benefits and the export promotion agencies, Indian mission abroads, colleagues, friends and relative might be helpful in gathering that information. So, so the first, so far as business is concerned, first we have selected the product and then we move on to selection of the markets. And then comes finding the buyer and that can be through participation in trade fairs, the buyer seller meets, exhibition, the business to business portals, browsing the web, then your export promotion councils, Indian mission abroad, overseas chamber of commerce can also be helpful. Creating a multilingual website with product catalogs, prices, payment terms and other related information will also be helpful. So, your web website can, comes in, in several different languages and a person can choose a uh, language in which he wants to gather information. The next step is sampling that is providing customized sample as per the demands of the foreign buyer. Th this can help in getting exports. So, after you have decided on on finding the buyers, now this buyer may have some specific needs and for that you will have to provide some kind of samples. As per the foreign trade policy uh, 2015 to 2020, exports of bona fide trade and technical samples of freely exportable items can be allowed without any limits. So, lots of, uh, lots of samples can be sent. The next step is pricing and costing. Product pricing is a crucial in getting buyers attention and promoting sales in view of international competition. Now, you see that you have you have made the product, you have made the sample and sent to uh, sent to the customer, obviously then customer will ask you for the price and this pricing and costing has to be very attractive because of increased competition. The price should be worked out taken into consideration all from the sampling to realization of export proceeds on expenses. The, the, then there, there can be various basis of terms of sales that is free on board and CIF. The next step is uh, negotiating with the buyers because obviously the buyers will buy a buyer will have different kind of conditions, different kind of terms and the seller will have the different kind of uh, terms. So, there is a need to negotiate. So, after determining the buyers interest in the product, future prospects and continuity in business, demand for giving reasonable allowances, discount and price may be also be considered and the, uh, the twelfth step is covering risk through ECGC. So, ECGC stands for Export Credit Guarantee Corporation. So, the, this cooperation helps in covering the risk. So, international trades involves payment risk due to the buyer or country insolvency. So, these risks can be covered by appropriate uh, policy that can be taken from Export Car uh, Credit Guarantee Corporation. Now, when the exporter and importer they were negotiating uh, in the 11th step, so, there are there then they come, come across various uh, terms of shipment and sales. So, let us look at those terms for shipment and sales. The responsibility of the exporter, the importer and the logistic provider should be spelled out in the export contract in terms of what is and what is not included in price quotations. Who owns the title of good while it is transit, while it is in transit, while it is moving. 
Inco terms 2000. So, this Inco stands for international commercial terms are the internationally accepted standard definition for the terms of sales by the international chamber of commerce. Now, these are some terms of uh, shipments that uh, uh, one of these will be there in every kind of uh, transaction. The first is X business that is EXW and at, that is at the point of origin. Now, what happens in, the, in this is the exporter agrees to deliver the goods at the disposal of the buyer to the specified place on the specified date or within a fixed period. All other charges are to be borne by the buyer. Next term of shipment is free alongside ship that is FAS at, at a named port of export. So, now what happens is that here the, the goods were made available at a particular point uh, at, a, at, a, at a particular place. Now, the goods are made available alongside ship. So, title and risk passes to buyer including payment of all transportation and insurance cost was delivered alongside ship by the seller. Use for ship on inland waterways transportation. So, the export clearance obligation rests with the seller. The next term of shipment is free on board that is at a named port of export. The exporters undertake, a lo undertake to load the goods on the vessel to be used for ocean transportation and the price quoted by the exporter reflects its cost. So, now as we move on the cost is uh, the, uh, the, uh, the cost that is mentioned will keep on increasing. Then comes free carrier that is FCA at a named place. Now, this is mainly quoted for air transit and multimodal transport. So, here this is for ship and this is for uh, for air and, and, and multimodal transport. The pricing conditions are very similar to those of FOB. The last term of shipment is the cost and freight that is CFR to be to a named overseas port of disembarkation. The exporter quotes the price for the goods including the cost of transportation to a named overseas port of disembarkation. The cost of insurance and the choice of the insurer are left to the importer. The next term is carriage paid to that is CPT at named place of destination. It is mainly quoted for air transport and multimodal transports. The pricing conditions are, are very similar to those of CFR. So, this is the CFR. The next term of shipment is cost insurance and insurance and freight that is CIF and it is to be named overseas port of disembarkation. So, the exporters quote a price including insurance and all transportation and miscellaneous charges to the port of disembarkation from the ship. CIF costs are influenced by port charges that includes unloading, warfage, storage, heavy lift, demerage, and they are also influenced by documentation charges that is certification of invoice, certification of origin, the weight certificate and other miscellaneous charges that include fees of the face forwarder insurance premiums. Another term of shipment is carriage and insurance paid to that is CIP at named place of destination. So, it is mainly quoted for air transport and multimodal transport. The pricing conditions are very similar to the CIF. Duty delivery duty paid that is GDP at an overseas buyer's premises. The exporters deliver the goods with import duties paid including inland transportation from the docks to the importer's premises. Then in, in addition to the terms of shipment there will always also be some other terms that uh, uh, there, there will also be payment terms and these are the various types of payment terms and that moves from advanced payment to consignment. Let us see each one of them. Advanced payment means that the importer pays the exporter first and exporters send the goods afterwards. So, that is the safest, safest mode of payment. Another as we move down, so it becomes more and more riskier. Another mode of payment is confirmed irrevocable letter of credit. A letter of credit that is issued by the importers bank and there is another bank that uh, and confirmed by the bank usually in the exporters country. The obligation of the second bank is also added to the obligation of the issuing bank to honor drafts present, presented in accordance with the terms of credit. So, now here you see that there are two banks that, uh, that get involved. So, it is more safer as compared to unconfirmed irrevocable letter of credit. In this type of situation a letter of credit, credit is issued by the importers bank and the issuing bank still has an obligation to pay. 
the next term of payment is document against payment and importers pay the bills and obtain documents and then the goods so first he has to obtain documents and on after that the goods can be uh, can be procured therefore the exporters retain control of the goods until the payment is made the next term of payment is documents against acceptance an importer accept bills to be paid on due date and obtain documents and then the goods so he here in this case he is not making the uh, the payment while in this case they are, he is making the payment before obtaining the document so an importer accept bills to be paid on due date and obtains document and then the goods therefore the exporter ga exporter gains a potentially negotiable financial instrument in the form of document pledging payment within a certain time period next type next uh, type of term of payment is the open account so there is no draft is drawn transaction payable when specified on the invoice so that is strictly between the buyer and the seller the next term of payment is the consignment a shipment that is held by the importer until the merchandise has been sold and after it has been sold the the importer will uh, will make time payments uh, will make payments to the exporter to conclude in this first module on export and import management we have learned the basics about exports and the provisions in the latest exim policy of india we have also discussed the steps involved in setting up of an export business in terms of and then we have also talked about the the various terms that are used in those transactions that is the payment and the uh, the shipment terms and the and all the with these terms an exporter should be familiar with and these are the one book and two web pages from which information for this module has been taken thank you